All right, good morning. Uh, we have like 15 more minutes until the morning is over, but it's still good morning. Uh, let's uh, uh, start the, the session with a quick review of what we talked about last time. Then we're going to get into dynamic memory allocation, finish it, and start member functions and privacy. Okay? Um, any questions before we begin? Suggestions? Yes. Yes. To, to, not to create arrays, to, to allocate memory. So, on the, uh, when I was looking on that, uh, I think what people suggested is uh, normally people would just use the keyword vector and use that syntax. Keyword what? Vector. Vector and all that. Uh, Should I? Just ignore it completely. That's OP345, that standard template library. Forget about that, okay? I am teaching you how to build an engine. I am teaching you how to build an engine. And I said, oh, you say, I went online and I see people are driving cars. Should I just get a car? And I'm like, I'm teaching you how to build an engine. It says, you know what I mean? That's exactly because Vector is using new inside. Okay? All right? That's the engine of, pardon me? Yeah, that's why I'm teaching you. Yeah, okay, all right. Deep breath and yeah. Okay, online stuff is very good, but take a look at your outlines too and stay within. Because when you go online, you're, gonna say, uh, you're not going to say, I just started learning C++ three days ago and tell me the information about new. They're going to throw everything at you from the beginning to the PhD level, okay? So we got to go step by step. But you're perfectly okay. We'll get to it. Um, Five months from now? Okay. All right. So, apart from that, any other question? But do not use vectors in my class, okay, because you don't know what it is yet, okay? Are we okay? Yes. Reference is just whenever you need to create an alias for an already existing thing. Where we can use it, where can't we use it, it is impossible to answer that question. It depends on your abstraction of your business logic. What are you doing? Can we use a reference in a function with arguments or without arguments? Yes. The answer, whatever you say, the answer, can we? The answer is yes. What do we need to? That's what you have to ask questions, right? So when you get to the point that you understand how references work, apply it anywhere you can. Apply it anywhere you need. Let's, let me correct that, okay? Okay, so let's quickly go through all these things that we were talking about. So we talked about references. We said references are uh, essentially new names that we are giving to already existing things. Essentially, a reference represents an already existing thing. It could be anything. In this case, that reference R is a new name for I. Therefore, we don't have two integers. We have only one integer. And we proved it with printing the addresses and all the good stuff. Then we talked about uh, initialization. We wanted to understand what is the difference between initialization and setting. And we said initialization is actually uh, asking the, the, the system to create an instance of something with an initial value. And then we went through the whole story of what is an instance, and like three people in class knew it. Instance is essentially one example of something. When you build something, the outcome is an instance. So that's what we call an instance. For example, over here, and we, I showed you three different syntaxes, three different uh, representations of initialization. Assignment at the moment of creation is initialization. Parentheses in front of something is initialization. Curly bracket in front of something with value inside is initialization. So I, J, and L over there are all initialized, but you are instantiated using an initial value three, which means those variables, those three variables, will not ever exist with garbage in them. They're going to get created with a value in it. Then we explained what is the difference between an ass assignment and initialization. Assignment happens after the thing is created 
and it has a value. It overwrites the value. It doesn't tilt the value. Therefore, in line 8, I'm going to have garbage in J first. Then garbage is overwritten by 3 with an assignment operator. So at line 4, there is no assignment operator. That looks like an assignment operator, but it's not. It's an initializer. OK? We good down to this point? Next thing we talked about was how the functions are called in C language. We said at any moment when a function is called, the arguments you pass to a function, it's used to initialize the arguments, the values you pass through the argument list. Those values are used to initialize the arguments of the function when the function gets created. The arguments of the function, they come to life when the function is starting to get called. And the values you pass through the argument list initialize the arguments, as I showed you at line 12. So if I have a full int a that, uh, that receives an integer and a constant pointer uh, string, when I say full val name, val is used to initialize a, name is used to initialize str. Therefore, uh, the arguments of a function will never have garbage in them. They get built up and created using the values they are receiving through the function call. That's how the functions are called. From there, we came to the point that because of that fact, although in it, uh, uh, references cannot exist on their own, they have to get initialized. A reference must get initialized, otherwise it cannot exist. Because of that fact, I, have ha I can have the argument of a function set as a reference because when the function is called, the arguments get initialized, life becomes beautiful. Therefore, in line 16, I can say get num number, and in a function call, integer reference val will be initialized by number, therefore, val becomes a new name for number. Therefore, whatever you do in function get num happens to the number outside, so I don't need to use pointers as I'm using in line 18. In line 18, I did a C version for it where I wanted to change the variable inside the function. I had to create a pointer, and I had to say uh, into the pointer val, then I had to say over there, overwrite the target of val, and then I have to pass the address of whatever I want to val, so the target of that address will be changed, yada, yada, yada. So we cleared that thing using a reference. We said reference, when you put reference in front of anything, that thing becomes a new name for an already existing thing. That could even work with functions. So we created a global variable, something over there, something like tax over there, and I call that function tax value, and I returned a reference of the global variable tax. So I could do something cryptic like tax value function is equal to 0 0.3. Because the function entirely, the function name is a reference and returns a reference, it replaces the name of tax. Therefore, the tax global value over there is represented by tax value function too. I, uh, so the tax, the, in this case, when a function returns a non-constant reference, unlike other functions, they can sit at left side of assignment operator because they are returning a reference. Therefore, they become alias of an already existing thing. And we said, remember this crazy, crazy reference? Three weeks from now, I'm going to remind you of it. They say, remember crazy, crazy reference? It's used for this. OK? So remember that three, four weeks from now. We will see this. Then after that, we talked about arrays and how arrays are set in, in C language. And uh, over there, uh, da, 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 we said an arrays, arrays in C language are created as, come on, come on, come on, you can do it. Arrays are created in C language as a pointer point to a bunch of things. So when you write integer a5 in, in the compiler, uh, compiler gets a uh, look at the thing. It says, OK, in my executable, I am going to actually put five integers back to back. Then I create a pointer separate over there called a, put the address of the beginning of, the, of those series of stuff in the a, and I call that an array. Now we understand that arrays are nothing but a piece of memory with series of similar values in it, 
with a, with a pointer pointing to it. And we prove that syntax, we prove that using the, using this, we said you have integer a5. If I create an integer pointer p and copy the contents of a into p, p will also point to the place a is pointing. Therefore, I can, if I print uh, the address, we will, I will see that the address is the same thing as address of a. But that was, uh, so if I actually did this, sorry, this is distracting for me. You can use it if you want to, because I have two screens over there. I don't know which one to look at. There you go. So, so if I have something like this, we will see that these two statements at 7 and 8, they both print the same address location of my memory because P and A are pointed to the same location. But unlike A, that is a constant pointer, it cannot be changed. Because compi when compiler this creates an array, it wants you to always point to that array. If you can change the value of A, then the array will be lost. You don't want that. A, you cannot change, but when you create a manual pointer of your, of your own, it works the exact same way. And you can use that to actually refer to your array. So you can actually say C out. You can say something like for integer i set to 0, i less than 5, 5 and i plus plus. You can actually use p over here to, to access the, the array values because they are essentially identical. So arrays are created like this. Arrays are nothing but a chunk of memory with a pointer pointing to them. That was what we talked about last time. I can compile and run that thing so you see exactly how it works. Where is my current thingy? That's the one. So if I run it, you will see that the outcome of the program is exactly as we predicted, which is essentially this. So as you see, it says, welcome to OP244NAA. And as you see, I'm printing P as an array, P is a pointer, but pointer, array, potatoes, potatoes, no difference. I can literally go through the elements of the array using P, and I can actually show what is the address in A, as you see over there is 3000. When I show the address of P, that's 3002. And I showed you that pointers are freaky things, they are integers, but not quite an integer. The difference between a pointer and an integer is that when you add one to an integer, one will be added to it. Well, when you add one to a pointer, pointer jumps to the address of the next target. That's the difference between an integer and a pointer. I add one to P because size of an integer is four, it becomes 3004 instead of 3000. It jumps to the next one. And we went through showing the different types of things. So if I say target of A, it works exactly like A0 because it's the first element of A, the very first thing. If I say A2, it's 30. If I say target of A plus 2, it is the same thing. So essentially, every single index that you write, like line 16, is translated in computers in compiler to line 17. And that's actually how arrays are set. Now that you know this, please do not use this syntax. It is cryptic and confused the heck out of everyone. Don't do that. They create the index for a reason. OK, so you don't have to write that. You can, but don't do it. That's kind of a show off saying, oh, I know arrays are a pointer oh, in your face. You don't want to do that. You want people to read your code properly. All right. That's just for, for our information. So that's that. And then we talked about dynamic memory allocation. See, what the heck is dynamic memory allocation? We said dynamic memory allocation is, don't look at this, look at this one. Dynamic memory allocation is when you actually don't know how much memory you want when you are compiling your program. Okay? I told you a very simple uh, thing to ask from you is impossible to be done without dynamic memory allocation. If I ask you, ask user to enter a few integers and print them in reverse order. You cannot do that without dynamic memory allocation. 
because your first question from me is going to be how many integers do you have? When I can tell you I don't know, that ruins everything. When you don't know how many integers do you have, you're going to say, was it 500? No, I'm going to say, I don't know. Again, it could be 3, it could be 5 billion. I do not know. Because of that, there is no safe size of array that you can create and don't use the rest of it and use only the beginning of it. Therefore, you have to actually ask the operating system to create your dynamic memory when the program is running. How did we do it? We ask the compiler, the, 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 the operating system, using a new statement. So new statement asks the operating system while the program is running new ask the operating system while the program is running to give you memory somewhere. Because your program is already created and your executable is fixed, that value is not in your executable anymore. It's outside somewhere in the shared memory with what we call heap. When you run that program, then you have the exact same array like the other one with absolutely no difference. The only difference is that now you asked for it, you are responsible to remove it. And because that is a fact that you have to remove it, if you do not, then that memory remains allocated until your, pro your computer is restarted. When you allocate memory and do not deallocate memory, operating system will keep it over there and not use it. And that we call memory leak. And I explained that memory leak is a very usual thing <clears throat> when programming happens. It's, it's very unfortunate, but very usual too. And we explained that the, the best example was to, when you see the internet connection goes off, they say, unplug and plug it for 15 seconds and things like that. It's essentially, they're essentially trying to reset so all the garbage off the memory, they are gone and program gets out of the hung situation. And to give you an example for this, what, did we, what we did, uh, I created specifically, specifically just to show you that dynamic memory allocation is not only for an array. I did the nonsense thing to create uh, the point, the the counter, the, the size of the, uh, to create a, a dynamic integer to hold the size of the array, where we absolutely don't need it. That was just for example. So creating a dynamic integer is a stupid thing because the integer is four bytes, a pointer is eight bytes. So instead of, instead of just having four bytes for the counter, I am first creating eight bytes to hold the pointer, then dynamically allocate an integer, hold the address of integer in the eight bytes, so I'm using 12 bytes instead of four. Absolute nonsense, but this is for example, only example to show you how dynamic memory happens for a single thing. So this size pointer of mine, it's a pointer that is supposed to hold the size of the integer, and I create that one. Always keep your pointers in the status that are null, Easy as well to make anything default, null, zero, whatever is to put an empty curly bracket in front of it, okay? That is a new way of initializing everything to zero and null. So if that was an integer, it would have been a zero. If that's a pointer, it's null PTR. If that's any other thing, it goes to its default state. If it's a double value, it becomes 0.0. .0. 0. If it's an array, all the elements will be set to zero. Okay, so that's that. So the size PTR is a pointer that is supposed to hold one integer. So how do I do that? I ask the operating system to give me one single integer and give me the address for it. I'll put it in size PTR. So size PTR only points to one pointer in here, one thing in here. So this is my size PTR and it only points to one integer. And that's it. That's why it's absolute nonsense over here to do something like this. I, I, I could just have a, an integer and be done with it. Okay? So that's my size PTR. But then I ask the console import to extract an integer from keyboard and put it in target of size PTR. Therefore, whatever the user enters over there for size, I'm going to ask how many integers do you have? And the user says, 25. So when the user says 25, C and puts that one in target of size PTR, and therefore I'm going to have, uh, I, uh, I will have 25 in the target of that one, and that's 25 integers. 
Then now that I have the 25 integers, I'm going to uh, 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 create, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the other pointer used that is my, uh, what should we call it, uh, pointer P. And in that pointer P now, I am, going to, I am going to ask the operating system to give me 25 integers. And then it's going to point to those 25. So line number 10 receives 25 integers from operating system and points to it. So P can be treated as a pointer, as, a, as an, what should we call it, an array. And the other one is a single integer. So what I do is the usual thing. One by one, I'm going to prompt the user to give me the integer. And I'm going to get, get the integers and put it in an, ar in an array. And I have the exact size for it. Therefore, 25 things are going to be great. And then I'll print it in reverse order, and life is beautiful. Then when everything is done, I have to give back that memory to the operating system by calling the delete twice, one for the array and the other one for the single integer. Any way you allocate, the exact same way you deallocate. The new for P is with square brackets. The delete for P should be with square brackets. The new for int size PTR is just new, no square brackets. The delete at line 20 is no square brackets. Which means if you put no square brackets in front of delete, it only deletes one thing. That's one of the most common places you do, uh, you have memory leak. You create an array and you forget to put the square bracket. You have 25 integers, you say delete P, no square brackets. Therefore, it deletes only the first element and 24 of them remains in memory. Got it? All right, and that was dynamic memory allocation. And that was it. So we went down to that point. Did we have anything else? That was it, I think. Was it? Uh, let me clear all. And no, this one. Yeah, that was it. OK. So. The review of the last class is done. Close all tabs but this. There we go. Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Are we good? All right. So now we know how dynamic memory allocation works. Life is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with all the things that we created. So we need to actually do something with it. So try and uh, make something out of it. So I'm going to take this out. First of all, we don't need it. It was in the other one. You already have it. Uh, all right. So let's see what I'm doing in here. First of all, I started creating some modules. As you see, one module over there is called Utils, and the other one is called uh, uh, Employee. OK? So first of all, get used to having a module called Utils, because that's, that's going to come handy as you are going through. I create a module. We know how the module is created. The header file has safeguards. The safeguards follow the exact same standard that we had. And any code we write will be written in, uh, uh, what should we call it? Uh, uh, every code that we write is written in, let me minimize this so I have everything, in the namespace stds. And therefore, I have an stds over there. And uh, uh, C++ module includes utils, and it has the same namespace. The exact same thing for employee. When we are looking at the employee, I have SDS employee.a. So I'm planning to give you an example for all the things that we are doing with an employee. And that's what we are doing. Are we good? Are we good? All right. OK. Ah, so. So, so, so. First of all, I'm sick and tired of using string header file and that annoying defined underlying CRT security schmiggly dingy that I put at the beginning. So I'm going to do my own strlen stuff. So I'm going to create my own function over here in strlen. This strlen is different with std strlen because it's in the stds namespace. 
So I can actually have two functions with the same name and the exact signature. No problem. And what does it receive? It receives a constant character pointer str. Uh, what is the type of that str, ladies and gentlemen? What, when we say str, it's a string. What is a string in C language, remember? You have the microphone, you got to answer. <laughs> a string in C is, or you can say pass. You remember that? Yes. OK. String in C is? Area of character. Area of character that is? It's not just an array of character. We follow a standard. That's why we call it a C string. A C string is an array of character that is? You want to pass it to the lady? Yeah. OK, pass it to the lady. That is? Is uh, and, and, uh, and the term terminator now. Thank you. That is null terminated. OK? So the only difference between a C string and a string uh, and, and, and a character array that is, one is terminated with null. We know where the data ends. So actually, to write the program for this thing, uh, to SDR length thingy that I want to write over here, that's extremely simple. Uh, it's easy as C plus C, C program you can write. So all I need to do over here is have integer len, okay? Make it zero, right? Then I'm gonna say while str len, is not equal to zero. I don't need to say not equal to zero. If it's zero, we know from C, zero means false. Anything but zero is true, correct? So I'm going to say while strlen has something in it and it's not zero, add one to len. Correct? And at the end, uh, by the way, if I spell the while correctly, that will work much better. Okay? And then, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to say return len. Done. I don't need two return statements. One will do. That's strlen. Okay, I don't need to. It's an uh, easy breezy thing, so I'm just having it like that. Now, obviously, if I wanted to write it properly, this integer should have been unsigned integer. Okay, because uh, what is the difference between signed integer and unsigned integer, madam? C. And did you did they teach you signed and unsigned in C language in in IPC 144? Was it part of the lecture? It was, right? Do you remember what it was? Okay, how many fingers? From zero to? Nine. Nine! Okay. <laughs> Would it be freaky having 11 fingers, wasn't it? <laughs> Give the thing to the... To the okay, so it's, it's five fingers, zero to nine, correct? Now, if I make this one zero, mm -hmm. and these are positives, what is the maximum positive? Four. And what is the maximum negative? Minus, minus five. That's how integers work. So, for example, a character is zero to 255. When you make it unsigned. When it's signed, it goes 127 minus 128. That's how it happens. Okay? And we have that for everything. Integers too. Okay? Integer is positive 3 billion something minus 3 billion. I don't know what. That is. 2 to the power 31. Okay? Whatever that value is. Because it has 32 bytes. 32... 32 bits, and uh, because if it was unsigned, it would have been 32, 2 to power 32. That would have been the, the maximum size minus 1, right? But when you make it signed, it becomes 31, and then you do a minus plus 1, and blah, blah, blah. if you don't remember what is that, go to 2's, com uh, two's complement, okay? And then you'll see what it is in, in uh, Boolean algebra. But anyways, we should have made it uh, an unsigned, uh, I'm not going to do it now. We're going to do it later on. Uh, and, and, and unsigned type in C++, they don't write unsigned int anymore because they, they created a, an integer just to, to, to show the size of stuff. Okay? So anything that is supposed to be size of something, you can use size underline t. That's a type. Okay? Size underline t. Size underline t that essentially means an unsigned integer, but it's shorter. Okay? Just remember that. So I could have done it. I'm not doing it. I'm a bad person. Uh, but it would have been nice if I did it. So, yes. Eek. Oh, all right. So the next thing I need to do is string copy. Oh, I'm doing it in employee? What am I doing? X in utils, not employee. Anybody ever said why employee? Why does employee need SDR? It does actually, but many other things do too. So you put it in utils, not employee. Okay? So that's the first one. 
The next one would be, uh, what is the next thing that I can create? It's string copy, right? SDRLearn string copy. So uh, string copy would be what? Vo uh, it's, uh, correct string copy is constant character point. It's actually char um, character pointer string copy. And it receives a character pointer for destination that copies stuff in it and a constant character character pointer source that uh, receives the stuff and you copy to. Okay, so what happens, how it works is exactly like this. So we're going to go, all right. So how you create uh, string copy, string copy is as simple as the other one. So all you need to do is to go into your I, then you say four, I set to zero. And uh, in here you would say, simply say, uh, what do we say? Um, uh, source I, which means when you reach the source of I stop, right? Uh, and I plus plus. And then you start copying every single thing one by one you pass through. So you say destination I will be set, set to source I. One by one you copy everything and it hits the null and it stops. So you do it one more time for that null thing to get copied too. Or you can say destination is equal to null, uh, equal to zero. Either zero or that one, it, it doesn't make any difference. So it null terminates it. Are we good? You okay? And what do we return? We return the destination. That's, that's how it's def defined. So you can actually get the return value of SDR copy and, and actually see what is the copied value. And that's SDR copy to you. So string copy, string length, two things we have. Life is beautiful. Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. We could make this one uh, safe too. So we could actually have something like... Uh, but since we can overload stuff, right? Since we can overload stuff, I can actually create another SDR copy. So I don't have to call it SDRN copy. So what I can do is create something like this over here and add something like integer len in here. So go to up to certain length. So uh, no boo boo happens. If I want to copy something, make, I make sure that I go up to only certain length. And to do that, uh, the logic is exactly like this one. So I'm going to actually copy that logic over here. The only difference between this and that is that it has to, uh, uh, the len should be, uh, sorry, the, the i, uh, at, it should be that one and i being less than len, right? That's it. So I'm saying copy up to that point. Obviously, if it was, done properly and it was size t, then I didn't have to check for negative, but because I, I'm a bad person and I passed, uh, 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 whatchamacallit, uh, the, um, uh, I actually forget it, I'm not going to do that. This is good enough. Okay, so now I have two SDR copies and we can do whatever we want to do with it. Uh, questions? So the second SDR copy goes up to length, and the other one stays uh, with, uh, copies all the way through. So I have string copy, and I have uh, string length. Okay, these two things I have. That's enough for me to do whatever I want to do with my dynamic memory allocation and characters. All right. So I'm going to use these. Are we okay? Are we okay? All right. It's kind of a review of IPC 144, I would say. All right. Now. Let's create an employee. So, Malady, what is, uh, like, I want, to, I want to have an employee, I want to hire an employee, and I, what I'm interested about that employee is to know what the employee is called. Uh, I'll, I want to assign an employee number, and I want to have an hourly rate for the employee so I know how much per hour I have to pay to the employee. Okay, so these are the things that I want to know with an employee. If I want to do that, what is a good structure for an employee? What do I need to create to have an employee? So, a structure. So, for struct, so give me two seconds. Struct employee. Okay, and then employee name. Employee name, that's perfect. 
So uh, what is the type of it? Character. So uh, name. So now from now on, remember, this is a standard that we are going to follow in my class. Any variable inside the structure, pass the microphone, please. The, what is a structure in C++? Another name for a structure? If you don't know it, just pass it. Class, thank you. So class, structure, potatoes, potatoes. Class, structure, potatoes, potatoes, right? So it's just a, it's just a structure, it's just a class. So any member variable of a class in my class, <laughs> in OP244, must start with M underline. So M underline name, it is going to be the name, right? So that's the name of the employee. And we're gonna put like, what? Uh, what is the what is a good uh, what is a good size for a name of an employee? Maybe twenty-five. Twenty-five. Uh, you haven't seen the names I have seen, my friend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some names are much longer than twenty-five. Okay, but anyways, so if she said twenty-five. I'll put twenty-five. So employee name, and I'm gonna put the full name in it. It's gonna be the, the whole thing. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna put first name and last name. I'm not gonna put the thing. So I'm gonna put twenty-five over here. So the length is twenty-five. Okay, uh, microphone, oh, is it your turn to answer? Who's it? Is it your turn? Okay, oh yeah, you said 25. Okay, 25, so why did I say 26? Uh, because of the null terminator. Null terminator, thank you, give it to the lady behind you, yeah. So the null, because of null term, she said 25, but I made it 26. So please don't let me tell you to pass it to the next person, just you answer, you pass, or you just wanna answer, you pass it to the next person, okay? Thank you. All right, so we said we want employee, we want employee num number, and we want uh, uh, hourly rate. So what is the next variable? Go. Uh, integer. Employee number. Thank you. And because I'm a C programmer, I abbreviate things, right? And what is the next thing? Salary. Salary, what? Uh, but it's not salary, it's hourly rate, so... Uh, uh, you, sure, salary. Let's do it salary. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do yearly things. So salary, what should be the type? Uh, uh, keep it simple, integer, right? Or float, maybe? Float? Oh, yeah. float, float, double, potatoes, potatoes. The difference is that, uh, d why, why? Give it back to the thing. So give it back to the gentleman behind you. Yeah. So when we are talking about, when we are talking about floating points, do you know why they call it float? Why they called it float? Floating point number? Because, I'll tell you. Because there's a decimal point floating around, right? And then they're called the other one double. Do you know why they called it a double? Because it's bigger, like double size? No, it's not big. No, it's actually double size. It's hundreds and hun millions and millions of times bigger. But it's not double size. It's double, double. Precision. It's double. <laughs> it's double precision. It means it's just more precise. Okay. It's more precise. It's not. It's not a. It's not just double size. It's double precision. So and long double is even more precise. Okay. With you, if you do accounting with the float, you're gonna lose a penny here or there. I guarantee that because it's not, it's very imprecise. So double is a normal thing to do. So the next one's gonna be double. All right, so we're gonna have a double. Ah. And the gentleman said, why hourly rate we want salary? So I'm gonna put salary here. Okay, so that's that. So that's my struct employee. And then what I need to do with this employee, I need to be able to set this employee, right? So in here, I'm gonna have to create a function to set the employee. I learned that I can use references, so I'm going to make myself, my life beautiful, and I'm just going to say over here, void, set employee, right? And in here, I'll put a reference of an employee, so I'll go struct, reference, employee, employee, or EMP, and then what I will do, what did I say struct? Brain sometimes goes, woohoo, okay, employee, Reference EMP, <laughs> okay, employee. So I create a reference of type employee and I set EMP and I need to pass character name. 
an integer employee number and salary. So this is what I need to create, and double salary. That's how I set the employee. Are we okay? Down to this point? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's very, very expensive thing to do. Yeah. What is the meaning of expensive? Who's with the microphone? What is the meaning of what? What is the meaning of expensive in programming? Pass it through. And? and memory and? Performance. What does it mean, performance? No, do you know that? What does it mean, performance? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. What does it mean, performance? When, so, when a program performs better, it is better in? Seriously? Get the microphone. OK, so when I say this program, what was the word that you said? Efficient, what did you say? Perform when you say this program performs better than that program in doing the same thing, one is what than the other? Faster. faster. When it's faster, it means? It can do things in less time. So first memory, second time. For heaven's sake. Like if I was thinking, talking about the person that runs and is performing better, you would know it's faster. So time and money. T time and time and t uh, uh, time, time and memory is money in computer science. Time and memory is money in computer science. Literally, that's why we call it expensive. Okay? So I said that's very expensive. Why is it very expensive? Because first, it uses more memory. Secondly, to pass the value, instead of just setting the thing and pass the value, it has to pass 26 plus 4 plus 8 bytes. That's lots of information. Lots of time to pass that thing, right? All right. So we know that. So that's set. And the next thing we want to do, we want to display the employee. Okay, so what do we do? We go over here, void, void uh, uh, display employee. And in here, I'm going to put a constant employee reference EMP. Why? Because I do not want to employee to change. Remember, attention, attention. Achtung, extremely important for you to know this. Every single logic that you are writing, always look for it. Is my logic modifying something? If that's the case, fine. If not, make the something constant. Always. This is an extremely important rule. This is a, like a vital rule of programming. It's not something that, uh, that uh, you can... Say. Please do not come to me with the phrase, but it works. That's like you are kicking me in the head. Okay, if you want to kick me in the head, you can say that. But don't, please don't ever say that. But it works is never enough. It has to work perfectly with best, what was the word you said? Performance. Performance. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we are doing it. So we are doing So to, to create these things, pretty simple and straightforward. So to get the, to set the employee, to set the employee, what do I do? Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to include my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful utils.h over here. <clears throat> so I don't have to do string schmiggly dingy. So in here, what I would say is, what am I going to say? I'm going to say uh, sdr copy into, so you see it says two, it's beautiful, isn't it? I can go over here. Ah. Ooh, you see that? All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say copy into employee's name, right? Uh, the name up to 25 characters. Ta-da! Right? And unlike the SDRN copy of C, I don't need to go and actually nullify something. Because if it hits the limit, the SDRN copy of C language will not null terminate the target. But mine will do. OK? So that's why it's not SDRN copy. It is SDR copy, but with a new uh, prototype. The next thing is to go to M 
employee number. Oh, EMP, EMP dot M. As you see, as soon as you put M, all the things come up. That's why we do M underline. Now you don't have much in structure, okay? Later on, you're gonna do many, many things over there. And that M underline is a lifesaver. So you do M underline and it only shows the member variable. So it becomes accessible. So <clears throat> employee number, employee number and is equal to employee number. <clears throat> Obviously I can have all that, uh, uh, qualifications of this and set everything to uh, a proper thing. So I can check, make sure employee number is with, between this and that. So I follow the business logic and all the good stuff or salary could not be negative and all the things can be applied, but I'm not gonna go through it. And the next thing is actually to display the employee. So I'm gonna write void. This, ah, let me just bring it. I don't wanna make a boo-boo. So display employee, and to display the employee, I'll go to see out uh, emp.name, and then I'm gonna put a uh, double code over here, and I'm gonna put the uh, uh, employee number, so emp.employee number, and uh, I'm gonna show the, uh, the salary. So, how to show the salary with two digits after the decimal point is uh, a little above our gate, uh, 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 pay grade at the moment. So, so I'm just going to show it. Okay, uh, I'll show you. I, I'll tell you later on. So, I'm going to put a space over here, uh, comma space, and I'm going to put over here the salary. And I'm going to go to new line. Oh, I need uh, for C out. I need to include. C, IO stream, uh, uh, system, uh, system header files always above yours, above custom ones, remember? And then uh, I, I can either do using, but because it's only one thing over here, I can do STD and, and qualify it. Um, and this one too, STD qualify it, that's the same thing. So now if I go to my main and write a unit test for my employee, in here I can say include include employee.h and then what I would say over here will be using namespace stds and I'm going to create an employee e we know that in C language in C++ I do not need to repeat struct because it becomes a type automatically now I can say set employee and I just put over here e because it's a reference I don't need to put anything it will be the name for whatever it is. And in here, I'm gonna put Fred Soleil. And for the employee number, I'll put one, two, three, four, five, six. And for the salary, I put one, two, three, four, five point sixty seven, whatever. Okay, so the uh, thing is created. I get an error over here. Let's see why. What does it say? Oh, beautiful. I love it. That's why I code, write the code live. What did I do over here? I just, I just told you three seconds ago, when you are passing something, check to see if you are modifying it or not. If you are not, make it a constant, remember that? And immediately I didn't do it, okay? So you should do it, because that is not a constant. It tells you, hey, you are telling me this name can be modified, but you are passing a constant schmiggly dinghy. Don't do it. So const in there and const in here. Okay, now we are good to go. And now that I have that employee, I can actually display the employee. And I put over here E, and that's that. And I run this beautiful program of mine, and what I'm gonna have over there is, welcome to yada yada yada, for that uh, Fred Soleil, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's the salary of the person. So see out when you don't mention, when you don't specify how many digits you want after the decimal point, it comes up with the best solution of its own. Okay, so it sometimes puts three, sometimes puts six, sometimes puts two. Depending on what is the situation, it decides how to do it, okay? Uh, we, we can 
overwrite that. I'll explain later. Okay? Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. So we said we have three pillars of object orientation that we have to follow. Three things that we have to follow with an object-oriented thing, design, okay? Three main concepts. The first concept was, or one of them, not the first. Three. What is in, the other one is, Paul, the other one is, yes. <laughs> you don't know? Next one. Okay, give me one of them. Encapsulation. Next one. Polymorphism. And next one. Remember? In, in no, in, in, ha, in, ha, inheritance. Inheritance. Okay, but don't pass it. Dude, you didn't answer anything. Give it back to her. <laughs> okay, inheritance. So, inheritance was to reuse design. Polymorphism was doing the same thing in different ways. Encapsulation was to put the data and behavior together. And we explained that. We need that. Why? Because every single thing needs to be able to do its own stuff. We said standalone functions do not exist in real life. We talked about hello at night and we got scared. <laughs> Remember that? And if some, you hear hello and you don't hear anybody saying it, you get scared. That's what happens over here. I'm saying set employee. Who's set employee? Set employee doesn't belong to anyone in here. It's a function that is standing of its own. I'm sending poor employee into a booth and comes back and its name and everything is changed. We don't want that. We want an employee to be able to set its own stuff. And we said we can do that in C++. Why? Because unlike C structures, C++ structure can hold functions. Therefore, instead of writing a garbage like this, what I need to do is to actually bring these thing, things inside. Instead of having set employee like this, I'll get the set employee and everything and put it inside this structure. What side effects does it make? The, first of all, I do not need to call it set employee. That's supposed to be employee. Okay. <laughs> first of all, I do not need to call it set employee. All I need to do is to call it set. Because it's an employee, set yourself. Then I don't need to say employee because it's inside the employee. See, his head is scratching. He's scratching his head, his own head. Because her, his head was scratching, head came up and did that. Okay? He didn't scratch his head, scratch his own head. Why? Because each one of them, they have their own head and they know where it is. Okay? Right? I'm not going to go, where is my head? You don't do that, right? You know where your head is. Okay, so that's exactly what does the case. I do not need to tell it that you are actually setting an employee. I'm just going to say set yourself. And same thing with display. Oh, this one is actually employee. Employee. And I do not need to pass anything to it. But in here, when I was setting the employee, I said the employee should not change because I'm displaying it, correct? How do I do that with a method? What is a method? <laughs> a method. No. Cost. No. Okay. It's just the name of a function. Okay. Either member function or method. Potatoes, potatoes. Okay. So we said. When a, a function becomes a member of a class, you don't call it a function anymore. You call it a member function. And we said that's in C++. If you open up an object-oriented book, they call that a method. So when you hear method, it's a function that is a member of a class. We got it? We all got it? Method, function, that is inside a class, a member function. Now, a variable inside a class, C++ says what? Member variable. Okay, OOP book says attribute. Attribute, member variable. Method, member function. Are we all good with this? It's going to be on your quiz. 
Are we all good with this? All right. So, so, so how do I actually make this method not to change its owner? I want display to display, not to change. What do I do? I put a const here. That means display, but don't change. It protects me. Not to hurt myself. <laughs> not to change myself. So if you want a method not to change the owner, you put a const after. It tells to the compiler this method should not change the owner. If by mistake you do so, the code won't get compiled. Let's go and see how we can actually write these things in here and make these things member of the employee. So this one was set employee, now it's set, right? And also it doesn't accept an employee anymore, right? And we have to say this is a member of employee. You do like that. So now set is a member of employee. It's inside employee. You say employee scope resolution set. Exactly like you did for a namespace. So the syntax is the same. All right? So now the good thing is that because set is inside the employee, it knows where the head is. It knows all those things. You don't need to tell it M name is inside something. It knows it has an M name because it's, it's, it's within the property of the thing. Every method of a class has access to the attributes of the class. That's the nature of encapsulation. Encapsulation is to put the data and behavior together. Therefore, behavior has direct access to the attribute. Okay? Therefore, member function has direct access to member variable. I'm going to put it in, in C, C terms. A member variable is global to member functions. That's, that's something that we all understand. Okay? A member variable is global to the member functions and nothing else. Okay? So, what do I need to do over here? I come back to my employee.cpp and remove all the handles that I put over here. So it works the exact same way. I just name the variables. So I'm going to say copy into M name 25, copy, uh, set the employee number to M employee number. And, and because of the standard that I follow, I know all the M underlines are actually member variables. I'm not going to make a boo boo. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? One. Yes, but this over here is much more thisy than the other one. We're going to learn it later on. Okay? This in Java is a reference. This in C++ is a pointer. We'll come to it. All right. But if you name it properly, you never need to. If you name it properly, you never What he was referring is that in English language, I can say my head. OK? I can say my hand. I can say my foot. OK? In C language, C++, we have the keyword this for that. OK? So we can say this employee number. It means the employee number that belongs to this class. OK? We'll come to it soon, and we'll see what it is. He was saying, so we don't need to say this and that. I said, no, we don't need to because we named it properly. Because the name starts with M underline, it is distinguishable from all the other things. And just be aware of that. <clears throat> and to display the, the employee, the same thing. I remove this. I remove the employee. I remove the employee. I don't know what did I do, but remove the employee and make it a constant so it doesn't change the employee. And I'm going to make it EMP code like that. And I'm going to say this is member function of employee. And everything suddenly becomes accessible to it. Okay, it made more sense if I did this inline. 
Okay? You can have the functions written in line if you don't want to have a header file. If you don't want to modularize things, you can actually put these inside the class. So you can actually create your class like this. Oops. You can put your class, uh, uh, you can put your method inside the class. That's not a good thing, it's ugly. Because you're putting everything inside and you cannot have a header file anymore because there's code involved. That's why I remove it right from the beginning, the first day, and I set it like this. So you put the prototypes inside the class, you put the functions inside the CPP file. But you have to mention who's your owner, okay? By putting the name of the class and that identifies everything. It changes a lot the way we code. Just take a look. Instead of saying set employee, I simply say e dot set and I pass the values to it. And then I say e dot display and it just displays it. And the good thing about that constant thing is that if by mistake for some reason, if I say m employee number is equal 23 over here, it won't allow me because I made it a constant. If I come over here, it's going to say, hey, expression must be a modifiable value. What are you doing? Your member attributes are not accessible. You set they are constant. In here, obviously, I can because set is not constant. But in here, display is. Are we OK down to this point? So essentially, every and each, every and each, function that relates to an employee is inside the employee. Obviously, I didn't put string header file or anything in there. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. Pause. Unpause. Now, we are, we are at the point that we understand that we can put the data and behavior together. But we need to prevent ourselves or other programmers to go although you don't see me, but please be quiet. <laughs> I'm behind this thing hidden, but hey. So although we are, we learn how to put the data and behavior together, but we have to enforce business logic. What is business logic? It means if I have a class called employee, it's the employee that is responsible to set its own name. I should not be able to do it manually. I'll show you what does it mean manually. Or when an employee's number is supposed to be set to something, I need to be able to do it through the employee's authority, to, through the employee's methods, not manually. What I mean is that, first of all, this set um, I'm not, so you can set everything at any moment. This is not setting, I'm initializing it. So I'm going to change the name. The name of the functions should really be what they are doing. Okay, don't name it something that applies to five different things. You can set things halfway through, but this is initializing. I am starting up an employee. So in here, instead of set, I am actually calling, I'm going to call this init. So I'm initializing the employee, not setting it. So I'm going to call it init. OK, and then in this program, I'm going to say initialize uh, in the, the employee. So when you initialize the employee, usually you set, you initialize them. You can have the, the first time you hire an employee, you set their salary too. But at the time passes, you don't change their employee number or their name, but you need to be able to change their salary, correct? So it's a good idea to actually have something to set the salary as it goes through. But I'm going to say why. I'm just going to do it like this. Right? And if I run the program, it is set. So 
Fred Soleil's salary was initialized to one, two, three, four, five, but it's displayed three, four, five, six, yada, yada. You know what I just did over there? It's as if I want to give the only person's name who I know because I had because is is Wilgard, so I'm gonna just use <laughs> So so what I'm saying is oh hello. Thirsty is hot. Yes, it is hot. I'm thirsty too. Anyway, <laughs> where is mine? Okay, I'm joking. No, 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 never do that. It was a joke. It was a joke. It became a trend at one semester. Please don't do that. Please. It was just a joke. So what I was saying is that if I owe him ten bucks and I want to give him 10 bucks. I give him 10 bucks, or as I see him, I say, hello, Will Gardner, I'm gonna put the 10 bucks in his pocket. Probably I'm gonna get a fist in the face if I do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, he was like thinking about it. Don't get closer than this, man. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So this is what I did. That deserves a fist in the face. I just pushed the number inside the employee's thing without telling the employee what I'm doing. And that's not right. Because of that fact, we have to enforce privacy. To enforce privacy, I need to tell the compiler which parts of these things is private and which parts are public. Doing something like that, fist in a face, will be prevented. You see that? M salary cannot be set to anything. Now, if I want to set the salary to something, now I can actually do it controlled. Okay? So, what I can do now have, is having something like void salary. And actually, I'm going to make it a Boolean salary. And I'm going to write over here double value, okay, and I'm going to, boo, that's a scary salary, okay, <clears throat> Boolean salary, so, so I'm going to do something like that, and I can now actually add safeguards if I want to, like, you are not allowed to double somebody's salary right away, it could only be increased 10%, <laughs> something like that, so I can go through, all. it shouldn't be negative, so what I can do over here is this, I can say if, value is less than zero, it, that means you're doing something wrong, right? And in here I'm going to say boolean, <clears throat> result is false, and I'm going to return the result of this function, and in here I'm going to say, oh, if it is greater than zero, not even zero, you don't want to make anybody's salary zero, so if it's greater than zero, then set the M, M salary to the value that is coming in and set the result to true, which means it was successful. So you can actually check to see if salary did something correct or not. Are we good with this? <clears throat> also, say I want to validate things to make sure everything's okay. If I want to do validations, I can add those procedures into the uh, employee. Like for example, when you are setting an uh, an employee, there are certain validations that need to happen. So for those validations, I'm not going to make it public because not everybody's going to use it. The employee is going to use to validate its own stuff. So in here, I can do something like Boolean. Why can't I type bool? Boolean, and in here, call it validate, for example. Okay, and in this validation, I'm going to have a constant character name. integer employee number, and double salary. And I can do any validation that I want in here. For example, I can say uh, name should not be empty. So in here I'm going to say uh, 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 that my condition will be, so I'm going to say uh, result <coughs> Boolean result is true. It means it is valid unless these things happen. So I'm going to put over here result. I'm going to say if name is equal to null PTR, null PTR, or name zero, 
is zero. So if any of these two happen, it means it's not a valid name, right? So I'm going to say result is false, right? Then I'm going to say if result is OK, OK? So if result is false, I'm not going to even check the rest of it. And in here, employee number greater than, let's say employee number is how many digits I put, it, put for the employee number, Anybody remember? Six of them. So employee number should be six digits. If to, for employee number to be six digits, I have to say employee number should be greater than one, two, three, four, five. And employee number, employee, come on, you can do it. Employee number should be less than one, two, three, four, five, six, and equal, right? And in here, so, oh, sorry, if it's, if it's less than, I want to see what is bad. So if result, mm, forget it. If employee is less than one, two, three, four, five, six, or employee is greater than one, two, three, four, five, six, if, if any of these happen, then result is false. And for double salary, if uh, salary is less than or equal to zero, then result is false. Okay? So this validation can go through it and set everything for me. So now, when somebody sets something to me, in here I'm going to say if, not validate, bad name, it's valid. Because valid returns true or false. Validate does the action. So I'm going to say if valid, <coughs> if valid name, employee number, and salary, then set all these things. <coughs> right? Other than that, I have to set it into a recognizable failure state. So I know this employee is invalid. Choose something, whatever you want. Like, for example, I'll set, I don't know, employee number to a negative number. Something impossible. Okay? So what I will do over here, I'm going to say, I'm going to say in here, I'm going to say in here, uh, otherwise set M, M employee number to minus one. Right? And the next thing I need to do is to see if it's valid or not. Okay? So in here I'm going to say bool is valid. Const. It doesn't change the anything in the employee. It's just going to tell me if this employee is in a valid state or not. And what I would do over here is simply say return uh, M employee number being greater than zero. Right? Done. Now I can I, I actually can do whatever I want. I want to set the salary, I'll set the salary. I'll go E dot uh, salary and I'm gonna set it to whatever I want. Right? And in here in my display, I can actually in here I can say if E dot valid. Display it, right? Why, why should I do it here? Employee is capable of doing it by himself or herself. I don't need to set anything. I'm going to go to the employee, <clears throat> and in the display, I'm going to say if <clears throat> is valid. Then print it. Otherwise, I'm going to say std see out invalid employee object, <clears throat> which brings us the meaning of the object. What is object? Object is an instance of a class. So class is the design, object is the instance. So whenever I say this class has five objects, it means it was instantiated five times. Are you okay with this? So now, <clears throat> everything is smart in here, and I can actually set anything to, any, uh, to the thing I want. Why is it giving me an error in here? What does it say? 
did, what did I do wrong? Is uh, stupid compiler. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's 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 what we always do. It's the compiler that made the mistake, not me. <clears throat> Which is always the opposite. Okay, so now in here I have E and I have F. And I'm going to set over, and you can even, uh, yeah, so in here I can actually go something like f.initialize to whatever, and set over here, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever, okay? Now, I, if I say f.display, this is what's going to happen. So I run the program. The first one is going to actually set the salary and everything, and the other one is an inv invalid employee object because I set it incorrectly. I put it for initialization incorrectly. And then after that, I can check if, I, if my business logic is supposed to do something, get it again or something, I'll, I'll go through it and set the val validity to whatever I want. Are we okay down to this point? So this was <coughs> uh, creating... Uh, uh, an employee as you see. All right? So what I'm going to do now, <clears throat> I'm going to get all these good stuff that I have created over here. I'm just going to uh, go to the today's session. I created an employee and all the good stuff that I have over here. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say non-DMA. I'm going to copy all the things that I have over here. So later on, you can actually run it and test it and do whatever you want to do. Copy it in non-DNA. Copy here. Did it copy? Yes, it did. Now let's go back to our thing. Now, <clears throat> I don't know what is the length of the <laughs> employee's name. It's bad that I create 25 and I write only Fred Soleil. F-R-E-D space S-O-L-E-Y. What is that? 11 characters, I just wasted 14, 15 characters over there, 14 characters. I don't want that. It's a waste of memory. I want exactly the amount that I want. For that, we do dynamic memory allocation. So what do we do? <clears throat> instead of doing it like this, instead of initializing it like this, what I would do over here, I'm going to go to the initialization part in here as I have. First of all, I'll fix my employee and I'm going to say, it's not 26, I don't know how many. It's dynamic now. Yeah, I just have the pointer, I'm going to make the array on the run. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say, when I'm getting the name, if everything is valid, I'm good to go. Now I'm going to do my... Uh, whatever I'm supposed to do. First of all, I don't need the 25 anymore, and I need to prepare the name before I do anything with it. So I'm going to say M name is equal to new character. Now, what should be the size of the character in here? It should be the length of the name that is coming in, correct? Plus 1. Right? So all I need to do over here, I'm going to say new character, and in here I'm going to say strlen of name, and I put plus one. Okay? Now, after doing this, now I have it dynamic. So, <clears throat> so str copy is happening, that's very fine. Everything's going to happen, it's very good, life is beautiful. One problem, I'm going to have memory leak. Because when it's over, those two employees will have something in them, like, or the first one. Uh, you know, it's, it's just nuts. It, it's not going to work properly. And other thing I have to tell you, lose the keyword struct. Struct, <coughs> struct is exactly like uh, class, no difference. So you can actually re remove that and put class over here. The difference is that for class, you don't need to put private. Class, by default, is private. Struct by default is public. That's an interview. That's one of the first interview questions you get for a job for C++ programming. Immediately they tell you, I just want to see how good you know C++. They say, what is the difference between struct and, and class? Rookies say, structs can't have functions in them because they remember C. Did you say that? 
<laughs> right? <clears throat> you don't say that. Immediately, you have to say they are identical. They are both classes. One is public by default. The other one is uh, private by default. That's all. OK? That's why I always use class. It's class here. <laughs> OK? So now I have the class. I have to make sure that when initialization is done, I finalize thing. So I have to come over here and write something like void finalize. Obviously, that's not going to be constant. So my finalize function is supposed to finalize things for me, which is what? Delete M name. Are we okay with this? So now in my main, what I need to do over here is to say <clears throat> in it, and at the end I have to say F dot finalize. And what is the other thing? Oh, another thing I need to do over here. Safe empty state. The safe empty state that I set in the init, I have to correct that. Safe empty state, safe empty state. What is, who has the microphone? When we were talking about dynamic memory allocation, we said a pointer should always be what when you are not using it? In a safe empty. State. Yeah, what is, what is empty for a, for a, for a pointer? No. No. <laughs> All the class help. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. It's going to be no. You can give it to the lady. Okay? I know you're not in class, but hey. <laughs> All right. So, so, so the safe empty state for a pointer is no. Always. Remember that. Okay? So if it is in a safe empty state, you have to set it to no. And actually, now I'm going to change this actually to, I'm going to return M name. And I'm not going to even put equal to anything. Why? I'm returning a Boolean. Boolean is true or false. What is true in C language? In C language, IPC 144. What is false in C language? What is false? False is zero. False is zero. Anything that is zero is false. What is true? The next person. What is true in C language? Anything other than zero. Anything other than zero. Do we agree? So I'm returning a Boolean. A Boolean is a type in C++ that is only zero or one. Nothing else. So if something is a pointer and pointer has an address in it, the value is non-zero. Non-zero is? So it returns true. And if the pointer is null, null is zero. It returns false. So you don't need to say equal. If you write return name not equal to null PTR, somebody looks at your code and says, he started programming yesterday. <laughs> OK? So you, you have to you ha be professional. When you know the meaning of stuff, use them. So that's that one. So now we have it. And in finalize, I'm actually deleting M name. And delete, if it's done on a null, it ignores it. It doesn't do anything. It knows it's a pointer that doesn't point to anything. So it's, it's going to do nothing. But if it's something in there, it tries to delete it. If you don't set it to null, it tries to delete garbage, which is some address in memory. It goes to some poor person's memory, tries to delete it. Either successfully deletes it and crashes the program, which means your computer, or the operating system is smart enough and crashes your program saying, hey, you are going out of your thing. What are you doing? OK? So that's that. So now, <clears throat> now what we need to do in here is to actually initialize and make sure we finalize both things. If we do not finalize them, then we're going to have memory leak. The outcome of the program is identical to the other one. It's not going to make any difference. It runs the same way. The only difference is that this one has dynamic memory allocation, which means first it's going to get into the program. Obviously, it's going to create those things with some, as you see, they're all garbage in them, right? Then it's going to initialize them, which means it tries to see if everything is valid. If it is valid, allocates the memory, copies, set, yada, 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 goes out, and sets the salary to whatever, and displays it. Are we OK with this? And then for the other initialization, it, the initialization goes back, it's bad, so it sets the 
thing to null PTR and whatever it's doing, and now it displays invalid. Then goes to finalize of, of F. This is null. Nothing's going to happen. It goes to the finalize of the other one. It's Fred Soleil deletes it, and poof, it's all gone in garbage. And out. Are we okay with this? Are we okay down to this point? It's never going to happen. You will definitely forget to initialize. You will definitely forget to finalize. We all agree with that. So there must be some kind of a procedure that I can tell to the compiler, hey, when this object is getting created, please set it up to such and such. And the, when the function is dying, set it up to such and such. OK? These are not functions. Not functions! Was that clear for everyone? I'm going to ask you that question, and you're going to say they are a function. Constructor and destructor are requests, procedures, you ask to get executed when an object is being born and when it's dying. They are not functions. You cannot manually call them. You cannot call a constructor. If you attempt to call a constructor, something completely different will happen. Because the job of a constructor is not to be called, but it's to create. So you cannot call a constructor. Although it looks like you're calling, it does something that you did not ever thought. So I don't know how can I inject this into your brains. Constructors and destructors are not functions, and they cannot be called. You will call it again. I don't know why. See, I go like bananas, and I scream, and still people do it. I don't know why. Probably there are two people who are not in class right now and didn't watch the recording. So you cannot. Did I continue the recording? Yes, it's recording. OK, and that happens a lot, by the way. <laughs> All right, so how do we create a constructor? The constructor's format like the way you create it, it almost looks like a function. It's not a function, OK? It looks like a function. The way you can recognize a constructor not being a function is that it doesn't have a return value. It doesn't mean that it, it's returning void. It does not have a return value at all. And the name of the constructor and destructor is identical to the name of the class. OK? So if I want something to happen when the class employee is created, I can create a constructor. How do I create a constructor? It means in, in five minutes I have to finish. How do I create a constructor? This is, by the way, for the week after. OK? But it's OK. So how do I create a constructor? You write the prototype like this, employee. So this is a default constructor. A constructor with no argument. They call it no argument constructor. So in my program, I said employee E. I didn't mention how I want it to get created. Correct? When you do something like that, that becomes a default or no argument constructor. A destructor is created like this. It puts a tilde in front of it, an employee. This will be called when object is being created right after will be called right before the object dies. And their syntax and everything is exactly as you see. You see, it's the same thing. There is no return statement. What do I do in a default constructor? I put it in a default state, whatever it is. For example, I'm going to say, when I create an employee and I don't mention anything, I want m name to be null. I want uh, employee number m employee number to be minus 1, and I want m salary to be 0. So to clean up the object. 
It's a default one. Whatever the default is for your abstraction, for the design you are doing, and for the destructor, what do I do? And for the destructor, what do I do? It works the exact same way. I'm going to write over here, finalize. Just, I don't want to remove the function finalize. Nobody writes finalize. <laughs> they actually do the finalization in the destructor. But I just left it there for you to know its job is finalization. And I do not want that finalize to be called. So I'm going to take it and put it in the private section. Oh, not there. I'm going to take the finalize out and put it in a private section. But its job is to finalize. OK? And many people, rookies in here, for some reason, they do this. Um, employee number is equal to minus 1. Minus 1. Why? It's about to die. Who cares? It's like you have a disp disposable, like you have a Tim Hortons coffee, and you just had the coffee in a disposable cup. Then you go to the washroom, wash it perfectly with the soap, then throw it away. You don't want to do that. OK, it's, it's the destructor. It's just about to die. The only thing that is important for me is to give away the memory I allocated. That's why I have the destructor. The rest I do not care. OK, so default constructor and destructor, some books that want to be correct in English, they call it deconstructor. Sure, OK, but destructor is a common mistake that we always we have used for 30 years. So destructors you hear everywhere, but the correct, there is no destructor word. Probably they added it to the dictionary, but deconstructor they call it too. But anyways, destructor. So constructor, destructor. Destructor, you finish your business. So now I do not need to have anything in here finalized, schminalized. When the object is getting created, as you see, take a look, employee E and F are about to get created, right? Jumps to the constructor, sets the first one to empty, jumps to the constructor, Set a second one to empty. Then all the business is done. And right at the end, jumps to the destructor for the first one, deletes it. <laughs> Employee number minus one. Let's remove that one. OK. <clears throat> and then goes to the other one and deletes the other one. OK. And I hope I have more than one marker. I constructed the green marker. Then I constructed the red marker. When I destroy, which one's going to die first? Red. So the things you create, they die in reverse order. Remember that. Everything you create, they die in reverse It's like a pile of plates that you put on top of each other. You always pick up the last one you put in. OK? Last in, first out. All right. And that was, construct, that was default constructor, not all constructors, and destructor. That was the end of today. Have yourself a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day. Ah, you, didn't, you didn't get to use it, did you? <laughs> Next time, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Yeah, you, you have like a typo. You don't close the namespace. This one, you don't close it. So close it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, everyone might like. Seriously, I didn't close it. Yeah, you didn't. Uh... I'll, I'll fix it. Thank you. Much appreciated. Give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. Let me pack the stuff, then I'll be with you. Uh, September 18th, DMA, privacy, encapsulation, construct, construct. Give me two seconds. Let me, let, me, let me pack my stuff, then I'll be with you. OK? Oh, I'm still recording.